everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Indigenous Canadian Agriculture and Human Resources Council Indigenous Sharing Circles. My name is Beverly O'Neill, and I'm your moderator for today's session on women in agriculture. So I'm coming to you today from the unceded lands of the Lekwungen people in downtown Victoria, that is the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. So very happy to be joining you guys today. For those of you in our listening audience, our participants, if you would like to share with us where you, who you are and where you're from and your traditional lands, that would be great. So add that into the chat feature. Uh, many of you guys have been in our sessions before. So you know we keep them as conversations and discussions. And in these sessions, uh, we do um, invite you to ask questions through the chat feature and the Q&A. For those of you that would like an, an additional visual on what is being said, our system does have the feature of closed captions. So you can turn that on by just clicking on your Zoom menu and uh, hit uh, choose captions itself. So always nice to see what people are saying in addition to, he to hearing it. These sessions are recorded. And as they're recorded, uh, we record them because CARC does post them on their social media. So for this session, on all previous sessions from this season plus the two seasons. If you wanted to review what's been said and the topics and, and uh, remind yourself of the great tips and ideas and experience and role models we have across this country in indigenous agriculture, then they're available for you to view. So um, today's topic, as I mentioned, is indigenous women in agriculture. We've got a few people from across the country. We've got Don, We've got Dawn Tabagongong, and she is our co-chair of our Indigenous Advisory Committee for Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. So she's going to start in a moment here and to welcome on behalf of the council. Some of you remember Dawn because she spoke last season on seeds because she's a traditional knowledge keeper in her community. So she'll introduce herself a little bit more. We also have Alana Copeland and Alana give everybody a wave. She's a she's a Métis cat. She's cattle farmer in Northern British Columbia and also Métis and a regional um, um, representative for the Métis Nation British Columbia. And we also have Norma Wolfchild give us a wave, Norma. Norma is from the Blood Tribe in Alberta. Not only does she work in economic development there, but she also is a operator of apiary, that's beekeeping, and, um, and does community gardens and a ton of other things. So to uh, uh, three really amazing women in agriculture from across, uh, across the country itself. So um, at the end of the session, as you guys know, we do a post survey. So once you, uh, once you exit the Zoom session, a post survey will, will pop up. And in there, we just ask you to share your ideas in terms of what future topics and speakers you fit. That's how we got a hold of Norma. As Norma said, I'm really interested in sharing our no our knowledge. So we love it when people do that because it helps us um, connect with with people across this country that we we didn't even know about, and and they always have great things to share. And of course, at the end of the session, Aaron Bryson becomes the most important person because he's the one that does the draw for an Indigenous participants itself. So I'm going to ask Dawn if she would like to do a welcome on behalf of the uh, Canadian Agriculture and our Advisory Committee. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Ani Bojo, um, welcome everyone. Um, it's nice to see there's 43 participants and I would like to say a big chimigwitch to Norma and Elena. I'm looking forward to hearing their story. A little, bit, a little bit about myself. I'm from Ontario, Wasoxing First Nation is um, where I'm from. And I got into this with regards to, again, about food security and stories I heard from my mother when she worked up in Cat Lake and uh, 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 another flying community. So when she shared those stories, it was like, oh God, what can we do? And I continue to strive to do my own business on the First Nation. And I actually work at a school as an Indigenous uh, coordinator just to pay the bills while I still promote the project and help people any way that I can. Miigwech for all of you coming in. I look forward to the stories. Great, thanks, Don. And Erin, do you have some words to share on behalf of CARC? 
Sure, sure. So uh, just, you know, as as always, we always uh, we always love having these sessions and we love uh, bringing everyone together. And, and thank you for coming along as we've we've continued to host these and through this this much longer series that we've had this year. It's been fantastic. We love hearing from uh, from all these these great experts here who have such fantastic experiences and stories to tell us. And uh, hopefully you can join us in two weeks. We'll have a session where participants can chat amongst themselves and uh, have a few breakout rooms. And hopefully we'll have that link to you today. And yeah, looking forward to today's sessions and, and thank you again. Great, thank you, Ernest. As Lizzie mentioned in two weeks on the 20th, we're gonna do another session, not exactly like this it's going to be an open session for you to chat amongst yourself uh, we did hear that people were interested in being able to um, converse and share their own experience and ideas and, and to ask questions directly with each other so that's what we're going to do we're going to do an open house where you can have some conversation there so um Elena is going to be our first speaker. As is mentioned, she's a cattle farmer, but she's got more than cattle. So what we were saying before you came on is I think cattle farming must prepare you for parenthood and parenthood must prepare you for cattle farming because except Alana says, it's two months when our calves, when our, when our cattle calves. And I said, as a parent, though, it's 20 years that you never get any sleep. So really happy to hear, to have Alana with us today, because I understand calving season is shortly, um, is shortly upon us. And then we'll follow up with Norma. Alana has to leave at, um, at, at, at half of the hour. So if you guys have any questions for Alana, please post them online before. But of course, our dialogue will continue after the presentation and after Alana has to depart. Many of you know that you know, our Indigenous women are the women that have often prepared the foods um, in many places in our First Nations and our Métis communities and Inuit communities. They're the ones that have been the keepers of the knowledge of the medicines and the preparer of the foods. When we talk about Indigenous agriculture, um, it's not just the farms and the and the cattle ranching and the large fields of, of wheat and hay and the processing. For Indigenous women and in First Nations communities, agriculture is about all forms of food security and medicines. It's also about maintaining the land and all of those resources. So when we define agriculture in Indigenous communities, it's foraging, it's harvesting, it's hunting, it's fishing, it's lands management, it's cultural knowledge, it's sharing that knowledge, and it's fulfilling our responsibilities to Mother Earth and to our ancestors and bringing that knowledge forward. So I'm going to now ask Alana if she would like to share with us and then for the rest of us, let's just go off, uh, off video so we can focus on Alana. Um, hi, it's Alana Copeland. I am president of the Fort St. John Métis Society uh, and I own a 1300 acre uh, cattle ranch in Northern BC. We run a hundred head of cows and we breed them and have babies every year. That is definitely something that women in agriculture do because we nurture these babies and we worry about every little baby that, that is born. A lot of the bigger ranchers, ranches, they, they're fine with their 10% loss. We are not. It's not just me though. I have a whole family. My daughter is definitely probably my biggest help. Um, she, but we're all busy because ranching doesn't pay the bills. So I also drive school bus and my husband has his, his trucks that, that he, he operates. And so we have six of us that, that help. We have to make, make our hay to feed the, the animals, grow our wheat, you know, do whatever. We also have horses because on, we live on the banks of a, a river. So we have to ride down and find all our, our cows and bring them home. And so we have 20 head of cows. And we have chickens and we have pigs and we we have our garden. We have we have we're we're very, very busy people. Yeah. Um it's it's a lot, you know, because we have to make sure that our our lands are kept in good shape and we do not we do not believe in all the fertilizer. We're we're an organic farm, so you know, we have lots of work to do. We have work. Our cows calve for two months of the year, but we work 12 months of the year to sustain us and our interests. Our cattle need fed all year. And 
they need looked after. It's a lot of work. It's definitely a lot of work. Um, so I um, have been doing. Alana, oh, sorry. Alana, you had, yeah, you you had mentioned. Um, how did you get involved? What got you into cattle ranching? So my father was a grain farmer. That's boring to me. My husband's family were ranchers, so um, we just bought the family farm and we we built our own ranch up from from what they had started and we've purchased a, a whole bunch of land and it you know it's just a family thing that we can hand down to our children also and they're all all of our children are still I have all my duckies in a row they're all loving the life and they stay right at home <laughs> it's it's a, it sounds like it's a real lifestyle because you said you know got two months of calving season starting and uh, as uh, as any mother knows you don't uh, you don't uh, you don't don't set a schedule in terms of okay at eight o'clock this cow is going to calf no you know that as a mother um, babies come when they come yeah so you, you don't sleep it's you're up for two months of the year and then I'm very lucky because we've got technology on our side anymore I've got cameras in my barnyard everything's cameras so everybody's in the house has a camera and if you need an hour of sleep somebody else is on those cameras it, it's good it's better than having to get up at 40 below and going out and checking all your cows I mean we still do that but we have a little bit of security with our camera system it's, it's a good thing are there advantages to to women um, being cattle ranchers? Uh, Annette Pelche Flamond had mentioned, with our staff, the women know better when a cow is about to calf. Uh, is that Absolutely. is that something that holds true? Absolutely, and we worry. Like you can tell when they're getting close, and we worry. We know we're the mothers. We know what's happening, and and we worry about every little life that is. This, that is brought onto this earth. You know, the, the men, they're rougher and gruffer and whatever, but the women, we sit out there and, and we watch and we make sure that everything is good where we have that, we have that Thank bond. You. Yeah. You said a standard loss of 10% is not acceptable in, in your, in, in your farm. It's, you're a mom. We, so we shoot for a hundred percent. A lot of these, the big, the big, um, the big ranches, they are fine with 10% loss. We are not fun. 10% loss, that's huge, not only dollar-wise, but it's life-wise. You know, we 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 are put here and we're doing this to worry about every life. Money is a big thing the way the world is going, but there's there's more to it than that. So if you the value is is about life. Yeah. For sure. I'm gonna uh, thank you, Alana. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. We're gonna come back to you. We're gonna go over to Norma Wolfchild. She's got some things she's gonna share in terms of what's going on because she's she's a she's the mom too. I would say probably over a thousand children. I'm guessing Norma as a beekeeper. Yeah, a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a, a session last year on on beekeeping mm -hmm. with Lorna Shooter and um, and a fellow. She works. Uh, she. Uh, engages with in the Merritt Valley and so every once in a while I'll talk to Nor uh, to Lorna about uh, beekeeping and you guys are moms too and you yes, and even yes. when the bees aren't working in the summer you have to make sure they're warm and healthy in the winter exactly. and, and feed them so we're going to go over to Norma Norma you've got a presentation you're going to share yes okay so yes Norma Wolfchild from the Blood Tribe I am Okay, so just a little bit about myself. So I'm a mother, I have three children. I have um, a daughter who is oldest, she's 28. And then my son, Maverick is 26. And then my baby is 15. So I work, oh, and then my husband. Um, so I've been with Blood Tribe Economic Development as a small business development officer for since 2005, off and on, um, did some projects with them and then start became permanent in 2009, worked up until October of 2021, went to work for Business Link. Um, I was the team lead Indigenous business strategist. And then I returned back to Blood Tribe Economic Development in October. So I took a two year um, 
I went to go work for another organization. Uh, I really miss working for my community. So the opportunity came up to come back and um, love it here. And in between all that time, I wanted to really understand my clients who were coming in and, you know, they were, you know, talking about ideas, you know, their business. So I started um, looking for ways to, uh, you know, to start a business. So I own a craft business as well as I've done consultant work um, in these, um, I'd say about three, four years now I've been doing consultant work. Um, so that's just a little bit about myself. Okay. So, um, like I mentioned, I am a beekeeper. So I started uh, beekeeping, I would say in 2019. I also have, um, I do, I have a garden and I also own chickens and goats. Um, so what started me on this journey is my husband is diabetic. Um, so knowing that, you know, um, that had a lot to do with, you know, just um, our, our diet, etc. So in order to help him manage his diabetes, um, we started doing research, just, you know, how can we help him with this, which we should have done years ago. But anyway, we, we found that organic was very, um, uh, was the best source and then just finding foods that were um, like superfoods like honey so I've been always interested in gardening so when I was a young girl we used to go visit my aunt and uncle and they had a huge garden pot and I you know it was so interesting watching him in his garden um, and then my dad and my sister they had a little small garden patch outside our home um, but of course, I wasn't, you know, it was interesting, but, you know, I was more interested in books, you know, as a bookworm. So I didn't get into that until, you know, much later in life. Um, so I think in the mid 2000s, um, I started wanting to garden. So <clears throat> got one of those plastic greenhouses and started some seedlings and they were doing really good. But, you know, if you're in Southern, if you've ever been in Southern Alberta, we have like really really strong winds so anyway we didn't we didn't secure it good enough and anyways it blew off and all my seedlings you know yeah it was just ruined so anyway um too busy I got really busy um didn't try to garden for quite some time um but that's how I you know wanted to get into garden it was just to you know be more healthy and you know just have uh healthier alternatives you know you don't want um um, you know, um, be, to be more healthy is, you know, just eating more organic, having, you know, just healthy food. Um, so I tried again in 2013. We moved into our new place and, you know, it was it did really well. But, you know, some things came up where, it, you know, we ended up having to, um, you know, um, put a road through it. So, you know, it's kind of sad. Anyway, um, I started. Um, in 2016, uh, probably 2015, I became, uh, our health department were looking at food security. So they invited me to be a part of the food security committee. So with that, we, we worked on doing gardening workshops. So our health, uh, community health, uh, work with them to, you know, just kind of coordinate the gardening workshop. So they would do all that stuff and I would just help coordinate, you know, doing other things um, behind the scenes. So uh, March 5th, 2016 was our first gardening uh, workshop. And then we actually went out into some of the uh, community members and we, you know, helped them, you know, set up their, their gardening. Um, so uh, 2016, and then in 2017, uh, again, we did some hands-on gardening workshop where we would go to different areas and host, um, you know, different um, different workshops. And again, just volunteering with community health. Um, let's see, just... So in 2016 is when I started trying to do some gardening. So learning from the workshops that I participated with food security and the, the gardening workshops, um, that really helped me learn a lot. Just, you know, how to do raised garden beds, uh, understanding soil, etc. And what, you know, what plants would grow. 
And so, uh, and then again, trying to um, help my husband with managing his diabetes, you know, thinking a garden, okay, that would really help, you know, there'd be organic, you know, we'd be able to control, you know, not even having to use any chemicals and stuff. So that was how I got into the gardening and really trying to focus on helping my husband uh, manage his diabetes. So in 2018, here's my first garden. So I had uh, peas, potatoes, um, carrots, and um, let's see what else did I have, onions. So it was just a small garden plot. And um, that was really good. I really, I really had a good harvest that first year. And then the following year, so this is my first harvest, my, my lettuce, my peas, my onions, and my potatoes. Uh, I was so proud of them. Anyway, and then, um, so in the, the years, the couple of years that I had my garden, I would be out there just looking at the activity. So looking at, okay, so we need, I need to understand, okay, what are some bugs? You know, what, what should I be aware of when, what's going on in my garden? So butterflies, bees were coming like bumblebees. Um, and so that really got my curiosity about, you know, beekeeping. Um, and um, yeah, so just seeing how I could, um, have more healthy alternatives for my husband and my family. So, um, you know, honey. So he, what he started doing was he would, um, he was researching what are some ways that he could manage his diabetes. Okay. Um, um, having alternatives, of, you know, for sugar. So that was honey. So we started buying organic honey from, um, you know, the uh, one of the health food stores. And then just understanding that local honey is the best source, especially if you have allergies. So just learning more about how to be more uh, mindful of what we're putting into our bodies. So um, he would have like garlic and he'd mince it up and then he'd drizzle honey on there. And he would do that every morning. And that really helped him manage and lower his numbers. Um, and then eating more organic really helped him, um, you know, just not having to... Um, uh, you know, just lowering his, his numbers and helping him get back to where it was stable. So that was really, really, really helpful. And so in 2019, I came across a workshop, a friend of mine shared this, uh, an upcoming beekeeping workshop that um, uh, Sutina was delivering up by Calgary. So I thought, well, let me check it out. So I registered and it was a two and a half day workshop. And it was basically just um, lots of beekeepers in Calgary that came and, you know, presented different areas, different expertise in beekeeping. Um, it wasn't hands-on. It's was basically just PowerPoint pictures. They did bring out some, some equipment. So that really, you know, that, you know, I wasn't planning on becoming a beekeeper. I was just there to just kind of get some knowledge. And if I ever thought, you know, it'd be something I do because, you uh, I wasn't much of a, uh, I was really terrified of spiders, bugs, whatnot, you know, that I was very terrified. If you know my family, um, they would say, yeah, you know, it was very surprising when I told them I was going to become a beekeeper. So anyway, the end of the, the workshop, uh, we had some, they had door prizes and I won this, um, I won a smoker. So the smoker is used to um, smoke the hives to calm the bees when you're going in to um, inspect them. So anyways, I won that. And then on the drive home, I was like, you know, I was so, you know, I was like, oh, I won this, you know, but what am I going to do with it? And then I was talking to my husband, you know, what, what would you, you know, what, would, would, what would you think if I bought, got some bees, if I, you know, started some, you know, um, you know, started beekeeping, he's like, well, if you're, if you want, you know, like, he's always so supportive of what I do. So anyway, uh, got home and you know started talking about it started looking at the cost and the one the good thing about that the workshop i i went to is they they had uh, so much useful information if i was ever interested in beekeeping like they had all the information they had they had um, costs you know projections and all that so it was it was it was expensive but you know, it was, I, you know, I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And, you know, we, my husband loves honey and, you know, this is what, you know, I could do to support that. And, I, I, and again, it'll be useful for our garden. So that's how I got into beekeeping um, is, you know, getting that information from that workshop. 
And then here is my first year beekeeping. This is me um, um, installing my the bee, the bee packages. And like Beverly said, um, so in these little packets, they're called nukes or packages. There's, there's about 10,000 bees in here. But as they grow, like there's like a lot more than 10,000, 50,000 maybe for a two, um, um, two box hive. Um, so that was my first year beekeeping. And here's me inspecting my hives and my son. And I'm trying to get them involved. I'm trying to get my children involved. Um, they've come out to do inspection, but they're terrified of the bees. And one of my, my older son has an allergy. So let's see. And then here is my garden in 2019, starting it. And one summer I had a high school um, summer camp. They came out to visit my, um, my garden. They wanted to hear my story. And then they visited my two hives. I had two hives that first year. And then here's my first honey harvest. And then in 2020, so again, you know, how can I have more access to more healthy food? Uh, um, I, I, we got chickens, so now we have eggs. And then my husband took a beekeeping course in 2020 so he could help me and be more involved with, you know, what I'm doing. And then that year I had four hives. Uh, 2021, again, so just really enjoying my chickens. Um, you know, I seen someone had mini, mini goats. So I have mini goats now, mini di um, Nigerian dwarf goats. I'm uh, planning to try and, you know, melt them and, you know, make cheese, so whatever. I haven't gotten to that yet. I'm still learning a lot. And then in 2022, we we um we moved our garden to a much larger area. Uh, it's about 40 by 50 feet, and it was quite a ways from our home. So we purchased a water tank, and then at, at the beginning we had a generator to we connected. You know that's how we were watering it, uh, but then we converted to solar power. And yeah, so just little things that I've learned, seasonal planting, know the difference uh, between cool, warm, hot, and cold season, when to plant, don't plant all at once, making sure to weed, and then utilizing succession planting. And then I'm still needing to figure out the water source because we have a cistern. So it gets to be very tedious having to constantly go to town, get water. So I'm still figuring out that water source. And then um, my bees and goats, just making sure I'm, I'm preparing them come springtime, getting them ready for winter, making sure there's proper shelters for my animals, making sure feed, water. And then last year, making sure that I have proper fencing. We had a, a bear come by my place. It was right by my garden. It went right by my apiary. Uh, but good thing it didn't go disturb my, my bees. I was so thankful for that. Um, but now it's like, okay, we need better fencing. Um, so looking into that for this year. And then now I have a dedicated space for honey harvest because I was doing it in my kitchen. And my husband was like, well, everything gets sticky. So let's get you a shed. So now I have a shed. And a few years ago, um, one of the, uh, oh, um, our community health, one of the, one of the nurses there wanted uh, to come visit my beehive anyway she you know we talked and and here they presented me with this book it's an online book um yeah so that was cool and I've been featured in the Galt Museum in Lethbridge in 2021 they had a beekeeping exhibit so I was part of that exhibit exhibit and in 2022 I had 12 hives I've learned to split hives. Um, right now I'm learning, I'm going to, last year I started learning how to um, raise my own queens. So this year I'll be doing that. And last year I had 17 hives. And these are just a couple of the goats that I have. And yeah, thank you. Those are just my honey. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. It's uh, um, someone, uh, Annette had written that she had bees once and you, you don't know fear until you've had a bee in your beekeeping suit. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. <laughs> I can go out to my. It sounds my like a Monty Python. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's so great. Hey, um, uh, Don, uh, if you would like to come on, that would be great. We'll get into a dialogue part right now. Um, sadly, everybody, Elena had to leave. She hadn't got called away to an emergency meeting. But I will. Um, we had, we had a couple questions that came forward. Um, this one was directed to Elena, but I think um, of all of you, uh, both of you, can answer this question. And then it was, she said, as a woman beekeep uh, cattle farmer, what kinds of obstacles have you encountered since it's your since it's profession that's usually dominated by men? And what are your successes? But I think we can just switch that to as women in agriculture in an, in an industry where it's primarily been men at the at the table and at the forefront. Um, how do we as as women um, uh, uh, reestablish our role in in the side of of food security and and offering food and retaining our culture? Any either of you would like to start with that question? Um, Don, like I to to be honest, I haven't had too much. Um, I guess problems in that area it's been so much support community support and yeah so you've I'm got, you've had a lot of community thing. support Don? Yeah. sorry the first thing I thought of was with what you were saying there was breastfeeding as women that's one thing we do to our children right um we want to have uh clean milk for them and be healthy for ourselves um it came to my mind. So now for me, I just think I'm always promoting, you know, food security, sharing. And one of the things now where it's all about with um, when it comes to agriculture is just like where Mother Earth is at with everything. And, um, you know, coming, what, do, what can we do to help clean her and keep her strong and keep her healthy? Because she feeds our animals. She feeds our plants. Um, so it's really important to think of those things too, with regards to, you know, having her healthy so we can continue to eat healthy. It sounds like, uh, and especially for you, Norma, it's like, it, it's about fulfilling your role as Indigenous women, as in, as as Indigenous people in maintaining and managing the lands and, and fulfilling that. So, so as uh, Annette had said, Norma, it's like, you don't know fear until you've had a bee in your beak in your suit so so that's fear sitting in an in, in being in an industry that's male dominated it's like ha, nothing I, i've had bees in my suits is that it yeah sounds sounds like that's it hey um, norma there was a question for you what kind of bees did you select for your first year of beekeeping and what's your favorite breed of beer of bees so i didn't have a specific breed of bees for me it was just learning learning about becoming a beekeeper learning about you know um so it was just reaching out to so at the at the um workshop there was um quite a few beekeepers there and so it was finding uh i guess a supplier so it was whatever they had and a lot of the bees that I purchased at the beginning were from New Zealand. So they were coming in from New Zealand. So I don't have a specific favorite now because I'm still in so much, like there's still so much to learn. I'm always learning. And there's, there is a saying that I learned at the beginning is if you ask 10, 10 beekeepers a question, you're going to get 11 different answers. So there's so many different opinions out there. So, yeah, and and I've just learned, okay, try this. If that doesn't work, try something else. So I haven't gotten to the point where I, I have a favorite type of bee. So um, I didn't realize that, that, that uh, you can't, I, I know that acquiring the queen bee is really critical to your hives. And that they're that they're uh, important. That you you mentioned in your session though that you had uh, you attended a number of different workshops. It wasn't uh, something you started out to do, but you, as in economic development, you um, 
we're supporting people and in, in exploring their ideas and turning them into businesses and then decided it was time for you to do that. So you went through a number of different workshops um, on that. And I saw you had a food secure, you have a food security committee. Yes. So tell us about that and how is it maintained and are there specific unique are there initiatives unique to women? So in I think it was 2015, 20 around that time that I became part of the food security committee. And so what we were trying to do is to establish the committee and provide, I guess, programs to support, you know, this food security initiative. And so that was making sure that you know, there was training, there was workshops. Um, I didn't get too involved with the actual setting up of community gardens. There is another organization that has community, community gardens. Um, so that's been my involvement there, not too much involvement um, in, in that aspect, but really was just working towards trying to um, um, access funding, etc. But there is a lot of so um, community health. There's a lot of work in food security, providing um, workshops on, um, you know, healthy food, um, doing, uh, what do you call it, um, workshops on, um, you know, meal prep, you know, stuff like that. So the, wor the workshops are, have been key in your community-driven mm -hmm. initiatives as well. Yes. Um, Don, you're in, um, is it Man Ontario? Yeah. What what activities are underway there to and get to involve more women in in the in our indigenous foods and agriculture? Well, you know, just hearing uh, Norma's story, you know, not we're behind. I think you know, in my area, even with our First Nation, it seems to be hard. You know, it, it seems like our lives are so busy and we're focused on something else. But there's a small group that are trying um, within our First Nation. One of the ladies bring works with um, brings in the a group share for community gardens. We've been providing small gardens, putting them into pe um, people's yards that wish. We're hoping to expand that they have a second above ground um, garden and get to a point where we're talking about where each household will grow a certain vegetable, one vegetable only, and then we'll share our harvest. Um, because our, I found last year we grew five things, some things overtook the garden. So we're saying, why don't we each decide what we're going to grow and then we share our harvest. Um, and it's a matter of just promoting in our community, which is nice. We have one band member, um, and his wife, they got uh, a little lettuce growing indoors. So which is so wonderful. Um, they just, um, I think they're going to be on their third third harvest cycle. They've been sold out each time. And it's um, just within community. Um, so it's nice to see that's happening. Fresh, clean lettuce. Much cheaper than um, the adjacent town that we have to shop in. So you know, they're starting small. It'll be nice to see that they expand, you know, and that it's just happening in our community because that's something, you know, I back before COVID and and this, um, again, a dream I have with just helping, especially those communities that are remote, you know, they're the ones who really need it most and finding a way to be able to bring in uh, fresh fruit and vegetables that they can afford and that are decent and they're ripe and they're not half rotten um because that is a big issue um and that's what i strive for with just these little places sharing hopefully maybe one day he'll get off the grid and share that knowledge so yeah because um I, I like you're saying you know look at what the community needs and and maybe have one person be the expert on being the the lettuce grower and the other person the onion grower and you and you sh share so focusing on immediate and community needs and norm i love that you your start was just like um you know the the comment that alana made about caring and it was about helping your husband to to return to good health mm -hmm. you didn't start off like an insects no. <laughs> but you were fearless yes yes 
Yeah. And that's what you I want to. Oh, no, no, I just want to add to that. And, you know, it's just, you know, and then also as well, my, my kids making sure that they know that they, they need to be um, healthy, they need to find healthy ways of, you know, like day to day things. And then again, and, you know, having them find their passion so it was me it was finding something that I'm passionate about because for many many years my 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 oldest son was in hockey and all I did was volunteer hockey all I did was do hockey 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 and that's where my time was spent and then he was done hockey like two years and he's like mom I'm done hockey you can done you can finish volunteering so it was in that time frame I had so much time and it was like, okay, what do I do? So it was finding a passion. And that's what my passion was. It was, you know, find, you know, gardening and doing all that stuff, learning, always learning. Yeah. And Matt, I just want to say for sharing your story and how you started your garden and where you just spent the time watching it, seeing what came around and how it could, um, what can help you, you know, with your garden mm -hmm. and, Again, our ancestors, that's how we learned you know, mm -hmm. from the animals. And there now you have these these beautiful bees and you're supplying mm -hmm. honey. And and it's just a beautiful story. I just want to share that with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, back to back to you, Norma. We've got a question because you didn't just get into honey. You added in someone says um, goats. Very curious about the goats besides them being darn cute. And by the way, in Vancouver, sometimes there's goat yoga too. Yeah. <laughs> and puppy yoga. I would love to go to one of those. It says, um, do you, do your goats do any uh, provide any any byproduct like uh, meat or milk? And are they helpful for weed suppression? Yes. So there. So the reason why I got into them again was because of the cuteness factor. But really, it's okay to learn more about. So my husband learning about managing his diabetes and how can my family be more healthy. And so a lot of us are lactose intolerant. So goat milk is supposed to be, um, it still has lactose, but it's more easy to digest. And again, looking at cheese, goat cheese. So just looking for healthy al alternatives. And I haven't gotten to that. I Last year I bought a, um, uh, Billy goat. So we had our for, first baby goat. And so I haven't got into that, but hopefully this year I can start trying that and experimenting with that. But again, we let them out. Um, my husband has horses. And so, you know, they're good for weeds in the little area that we have. Um, but yeah, it's still so much learning, but that was my whole intent was to have the byproduct, like the, the milk, the cheese, and again, goat soap. You know, I love to do crafts because with my bees, my wax, I make candles, I make body lotions, lip balms. So all that stuff, candles. Mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting that you've expanded. You, you got the goats, not just because they're cute, mm -hmm. but to help, again, address a, another a health a health matter that, that came up. Because uh, as we age... Um, as we age, things don't work the way they used to work. So that <laughs> yeah. uh, alternative to uh, to uh, go uh, cattle uh, uh, beef cheese and byproducts is good. So um, someone else has said that they had an apiary for several years, and but sadly, in a twenty four hour span, all of the bees died off. So uh, in one of the sessions uh, and before about beekeeping, uh, Lorna. And Kent were mentioning the importance of working together in a region. Do you guys uh, do work together in your area with with others um, in the non-indigenous community and in the indigenous community on on food food knowledge and things to do with agriculture? So here we have lots of support. Uh, we have an organization called Kipa. So I'm I'm planning on becoming more involved with them. So it's that Sakaina Ecological Protection uh, Association. And so a lot of times it's talking about water access to water. So they're there for the the support there. Um, but again, um, I'm the only beekeeper in um, on the Blood Reserve. I don't have. I've tried reaching out to see if there's a network for beekeepers in Southern Alberta. I didn't have much luck, but thankfully the 
the workshop that I did take, I still have connections with the beekeepers there and they're totally supportive. I have beekeeper friends in Calgary. And so we oftentimes we we discuss, you know, different issues, problems. So it's again, it's just reaching out, doing some research um, and then just not, you know, finding some finding support. That's that's what I do. I just go out and find support, ask questions. And yeah. Yeah, so whether it's an informal group or a formal group, connect, it, it sounds like is a, mm -hmm. it said that a disease in one hive can take out hives yes. in, all over the area. Yes, Very important be, to yeah, do that. And always no, learning, I, yeah. learning about, you know, how can you manage them, you know, making sure that you're, you know, you're preparing, like it's, yeah, you're busy spring to fall, but you have to make sure before going into fall that you prepare them, you, you know, you have, they have enough uh, food resources they're you know they're protected from the environment like the cold and stuff yeah yeah on on that one and like I said I understand winter is very important you got to feed those little critters keep them warm warm they're not going they're not going to Hawaii for some time off they're not flying south you need to keep them healthy and safe there Don what are you doing in your area to connect and get the other women in, involved um, basically just in community sharing, talking, and again, it's like, and, um, Norma said, it's just, you know, going and asking and finding out and, um, sharing what you know, um, being available, should someone call you, um, I do. And again, when you mentioned non-indigenous, um, I have a, a, a friend that we grew up together, went to high school, public high school together. And she is doing a beautiful job with an organic farm. And um, she they started small, going back about maybe 10 years ago now with, with one garden. Now she's got multiple gardens and now she's got the big tarps where they're growing during the winter months. And, and she has her little market um, sharing, you know, each other's stories. Um, but I'm always, and then she goes, I always, and then she, again, they farm her and her husband. She also has a full-time job, she says, because again, it's hard because farming doesn't pay the bills, right? So she has to keep her job. And she goes, any time that I take off or use my holidays is all spent on the farm, um, which is nice and, to and see. Norma, yeah, and Norma, you said that your your beekeeping, your goats, your horses, that's one of the things you do. Because you also do small business you're in economic development and, and that so um any activities in in getting more women in this field there's my pun how long Pete did anybody have any bets in terms of how long it would take me to say that and how to get more women in this field is it a growing industry <laughs> okay it, it's Over it's so I had um a few before COVID I had uh a department that was interested in me coming in to help them with setting up an apiary but with COVID everything kind of just you know we haven't talked yet but I know um, you know they want me to see how I can help them with that um, setting up a, a even a community apiary so hopefully that's in the works um, I have attended a few agriculture uh, conferences where I was a panel member so, you know, it's it's sharing my story and, you know, just encouraging, you know, other other women, other people who are interested to just, you know, give it a try. And yeah, just trying, you know, at least giving it a try. It may not be for you, but, you know, it's I love it. <laughs> but it's um, as you said, I mean, you started off doing it for your household, for your family. Mm -hmm. And it's ex it's expanded to um, you. You now have the what is that Blackfoot honey and crafts. Mm -hmm. So are you selling, are you selling your items? And, and if so, where? So I have a Facebook page. I'm not very active on there. I've been kind of just busy, but I do have, I've set up at a few um, local markets where I have my honey available, my um, candles, my um, lotion bars, lip balm. Um, yeah. So I've done that. And I do other crafts like crochet. I'm a crocheter. Um, I do custom dolls, etc. Yeah, those crochet scarves have been big hit this winter season too. By the way, that's all the rage, <laughs> and 
in fashions is like such crochet. Hey, um, one last question here, and then we're going to go to some closing comments before we do the final draws. Uh, what about liability? Did you have difficulties getting insurance? I myself don't have insurance. Um, we're on the reserve, so we're not required to have any insurance. Um, like we don't, it's not a requirement. Um, so I don't have issues with insurance, but I know when the the high school group came out, um, I made sure that they we had beekeeping suits, but I didn't get them too close because, you know, I didn't want to have that liability issue. But I did mention if I'm going to be doing this, I need to make sure I do have insurance just to protect not only myself, but, you know, the people that do come out to visit. Yeah, and I know that having someone, being someone who's supporting some events, usually what happens is that in a case like that, the school probably extended the liability insurance mm -hmm. in that way because as a micro business right now, you know, it's it's like probably making some decisions in terms of what mm -hmm. direction do you go to? Do you mm -hmm. want to get into more higher productions? If so, then there are some yes. other steps that you have to take in place because uh, 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 on reserve, it's all, it's, different than being off reserve but also if you get into food inspection and safety it's federal jurisdiction then mm -hmm. yes so, yes so very much more um to you to both of you any final comments how, how do we get more indigenous women in this industry i almost said field again how do we get more indigenous women in this industry um any suggestions on how you get started and and um um what are your thoughts uh, just creating awareness, you know, the different areas that women can go into and just finding the working with organizations to provide the training, and et cetera. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. creating that awareness. Yeah. Awareness and connecting. Over to you, Dawn. I'm going to say planting the seeds with our, our women around mm -hmm. and anyone, right? You plant that seed with sharing what you're doing or sharing that idea. That's planting that seed. The other thing I think of, again, I'm again, learning a lot about our culture is, you know, mother, um, that bellabin cord of the baby. I've been told that you put that wherever you want that child to grow or and so the passion is going to be where they're going to get into or learn about so maybe we start putting them with the seeds of our 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 uh, vegetables that we grow um and that's it's a funny story but i've heard you, that, that that's what they used to do a long time ago you win you win the award for best pun of the session planting the, <laughs> the seed very <laughs> Yeah. Very good. Uh, I just want to su uh, summarize here. It's like what I've heard you guys say is like, you know, it's it's about just doing because if you think that this that uh, that uh, there should be that there's fear in this industry of women getting more involved. It's like you don't know fear until you've had that be in your suit so much for that be in the bonnet, but you're be in the suit. So you just do it because it's a sense of responsibility. It's about caring. And I really love Alana's Alana's comment is we know we are more in tune as as women with cattle birthing um, than than others because you know what it's like so you're watching more it's not just about the money it's about it's about caring it's about the love and for you Norma you got into it because you care and 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 interest so you just do it you don't let the berries you might start off with just attending some workshops getting some knowledge going there. Uh, as Dawn said, love that you watched the land and what was going on first. And you overcame your fears by going, I know this is this is, um, is great. I'm going to try the beekeeping. And whether there is a formal group around or not, just make connections and share knowledge amongst each other. And I love that you, you know, you're you you support people getting into business is a, that that was my role 35 years ago was when economic development was just starting was to help people. And it's hard to talk about small business if you haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, and I, for both of you guys, it's about role modeling. And mm -hmm. you, as you said, Dawn, uh, planting the seed and, and being a good role model, because you said, Norma, you're getting your children involved and in, you're getting your children involved as well. And other community members and attending workshops and participating in committees like the food security committee. Um, one final, any final comment you'd like to make before we turn it over to Aaron? 
Uh, no, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to um, share my story. And yeah. I'm really glad you were able to join us, Dawn. Um, no, other than keep planting seeds, everyone. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And uh, we had a couple other questions that came through and and it sounded like, like that was really more of a, of a germination for what's going, we're going to do on the 20th. So uh, it sounded like people are really interested in, in being able to dialogue directly with with each other. As mentioned, on March 20th, in two weeks from now, Wednesday, same date, same, uh, same time, um, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Ottawa time, whatever time it is in your part of the part of the world, that is the same that we'll be hosting this. It'll give you a chance to have an open dialogue. So it will be a Zoom session versus a Zoom webinar. So you'll be able to ask those questions. Let us know in the survey that's going to pop up after you exit the Zoom. Um, if there's specific topics you want to talk about, because uh, Norma, beekeeping, um, I know uh, Patrick wanted to talk about beekeeping, and there's a few other people would probably like to get involved. So let us know what the topics uh, topics are that you want to do. And now we ask Aaron Bryson if he can come online. So for those of you um, that are online, remember if your name comes up in the screen, um, let us know right away that you're there, because if you're not if we don't hear from you right away, Aaron will draw another name. So we're doing a draw right now for $100, um, uh, um, $100. So there you go. And uh, Aaron has added a link in the chat. And that is if you want to register for the session on the 20th, just click on that and uh, you'll get that. And like I said, that's going to be a Zoom session versus a webinar. So you'll be able to dialogue with each other and have conversations. So thank you very much, Norma and Dawn and to Alana, who sadly had to had to leave really great and again good inspirations planting the seed of our knowledge and inspiration in foods and agriculture in indigenous communities and to the rest of you guys thank you for joining us in the session a reminder that to the canadian agriculture human resources council is and the indigenous advisory council is developing a series of guides in in um, a, a startup guides and information sheets. And these are on a quick thing, a quick, quick. Okay. And these are, there you go. A uh, greenhousing, regenerative farming, lots of comments on that. Community gardens, composting soil, apiary beekeeping and building partnerships through reconciliation and some information sheets on food labeling, small scale animal farming and community infrastructure to food sovereignty and security. So those sheets will be coming out sometime in the summer or in the fall or, and I'll start up information to get you started. Again, you guys, thank you all for joining us. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Um, and thank you for joining us in our past sessions. Um, again, Norma, uh, Alana, and um, Dawn, thank you, and to Kark. Everyone stay safe.